Hey everyone, welcome to the ThoughtBot. I've been thinking lately if we are truly a democracy based on some discussions that I've had with friends and family and some reading that I've done. And let me clarify my question. So a democracy means rule by people. And what it really means is rule by general public of a country or a nation. And that's hardly what we see in our current system, which is the parliamentary democracy. If you understand a little bit and you search for terms like oligarchy, bureaucracy, aristocracy, and things like that, you would find that what we have as a system is at best an oligarchy, which is ruled by a few, or some sort of aristocracy, which is ruled by a certain elite of the society. And it's not ruled by people as democracy demands. While the people have equal rights to participate in the elections, and run for the office if they meet the minimum eligibility criteria. They do not get a equal consideration or a fair and just consideration or even a level playing field by the system. The system is designed that way and let me explain why. The system imposes a number of hurdles or obstacles for an everyday Joe if he wants to run for office, which the system doesn't pose on people that come from the minority of elites or aristocrats or professional politicians. And there are a number of these obstacles, but I'm just gonna talk about three major constraints. One being the financial constraint, the second being the social constraint and the social um, aspect of it. And the third being the aspect of human bias that affects the democratic process in one way or another. So. Let's talk about the financial process first. If you take a snapshot of the Canadian Parliament, you would easily see that most of the member of parliaments are either established businessmen or high earning lawyers, doctors, surgeons, or professional politicians. This represents a very small portion of, the, of our national fabric. This is, represents a very small portion of our demographics. And it's easy to understand why it is like that. Because if you look at the average spending of each uh, member of parliament during the, their campaign period, um, and let's say you take a look at either a member from the Liberal Party or the Conservative Party, which make the bigger portion of the Canadian Parliament, you would find that each of these members spent at least 90K to 110K um, in Canadian dollars during their campaigns. They had to take uh, at least six weeks off to run the actual campaign. And this is only too theoretically. Uh, in the practical world, you would realize that if you're an everyday Joe who is new to politics, who doesn't have established presence, you would have to, uh, you would have to spend at least a year to two years campaigning full time to establish your presence. Not just that, as I said, you would have to have that kind of money, at least 90 to 110K to spare and you don't just need the time and money to, in, to be invested in your political campaign. You also need a fallback plan in case you do not win the elections. Now that's for the financial cost. When you talk about the social cost, you have to be someone with a very thick skin. You need to be ready for the online bullying, for the vitriol that goes on uh, with these sort of campaigns from the political rivals, from other parties and the general public at times, which is not easy to handle to say the least. So what happens when you have member of parliaments making laws from only the well-off uh, part of the society, from only the well-off portion of the society? Uh, what happens is our economic experiences determine our experiences in life in general. And our experiences in life in general influence how we make decisions. So these people are making laws and taking decisions that affect all the Canadians or all the general population uh, with little to no understanding of the real experience of the general population of their lives. And last but not the least, I want to quickly touch on the factor of human bias. So Jagmeet Singh, who is currently the leader of the NDP, a political party in Canada, is not only a person of color, but also someone who wears a turban uh, as a religious symbol on his head. Faced a lot of 
high profile racism during his campaign and his party lost a lot of seats. Now, it won't be fair to say that his party lost all of the seats because he was a person of color or he wears a turban. But for sure, if you look into the news and read a little bit, you would understand that it was a very big factor. And sometimes, you know, that makes you think that how really could you have a level playing field for someone um, uh, for, for everybody, uh, regardless of their color, faith, um, education, financial status, uh, and all of that. So all of those thoughts motivated me to read a little bit about the alternate forms of government that have been proposed uh, in recent times. And one of the books that I read was Towards a New Socialism. Um, and that book offers a very interesting model of governance that at least theoretically seems to address all these concerns that I uh, just shared with you guys and offers a model that seems very close to a perfect form of democracy. So I reached out to the co-author of the book Towards the New Socialism that talks about this model of democracy, uh, asking him to help me understand in a little more detail and in layman terms, this proposed model of democracy. Uh, that he talks about in his book. Mr. Paul Cockshot is a computer scientist and economist who has a multitude of books and papers written on these two subjects. And today I'm extremely honored that he's joining us to help us understand his proposed model of democracy and give it some serious thought. Mr. Paul Cockshot, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much for joining us from Glasgow. I see it's a nice evening out there. You're sitting in your garden. Um, if you could please uh, help me understand the proposed model of democracy in your book towards the new socialism uh, that we spoke about. Well, the key principle that we put forward is firstly that major decisions should be taken by plebiscite or referendum. And since the book was written, me and colleagues at the computer science department in Glasgow have done practical research on developing mobile phone voting apps that could be used for these purposes. Uh, it's a system called Handy Vote. Basically, it allows you to vote on yes, no issues, like do you want a particular law to come in, but it also lets you vote on quantitative issues, like what level of taxation should there be? how much should be spent on education, how much should be spent on um, libraries, how much should be spent on, on different things and balances that against the levels of taxation that people want. So you can simultaneously vote on expenditure and on taxation and it adds up the requests of everybody in the community and comes to a consensus position. All right, and, and as compared to what we have right now is uh, there's an MP that's been elected in the elections and they pretty much make all the decisions or most of the decisions without no, they don't this referendum. That. They don't. The, one person makes the, the decision in Britain, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and I imagine the same the finance minister makes a decision in Canada. Correct. Yes, that, that is exactly the case. And if MPs vote, as I said, you know, the MPs have a loyalty towards the party first, and then at the same time, they try to manage the expectations of their constituents, right, which is not the greatest yeah. idea. But the actual decisions are taken by maybe one person perhaps consulting with the prime minister. So it's right. one or two people. Right. So how do we how do we exactly change that? In in your book, you talk about Aristotle's idea of democracy. I think you speak a little bit about you talk a little bit about the Plato's uh, Republic as well, and you yeah. think that there should be there should be councils as opposed to MPs. Um, so I well, think the in the model described by Aristotle, many decisions on expenditure are taken by the citizens as a whole. Uh, since they were dealing with cities, they could just get everyone into the town square and vote on it. Obviously, nowadays, you, have to, you would have to do that electronically. Um, in between, the day-to-day -day running of the state was done by a council, and the council was elected by lot rather than by vote, so that each member of the electorate had the equal chance of being chosen to be on the council. 
and they used right. random number of voting machines to do it. Um, pe people had citizen cards um, made out of brass since it was the Bronze Age, not, not out of plastic, with their names on them, right. and they put them into a machine. And handles okay. were turned, and it, it was decided who, who was going to be on the council on the basis of a random number generator. That, that is very interesting because that clearly addresses the points that I raised in the uh, introduction of the show that, you know, there's a natural human bias. A, a lot of studies and research have been done that when we uh, live our everyday lives, we as human beings are driven by emotion, by bias. Uh, and that bias can, you know, range all over the place from, you know, ethnic bias, sexual bias, uh, and so on and so forth. So that literally addresses that. Now, what you're saying is instead of having an MP, there would be a whole body of council, let's say five to 10 representatives selected by a random vote. And then these yes. people, uh, you know, these people collectively hold the power to decision making. And because they've well, been... They they only hold the power to to do things in between okay the whole population sets the policy and they then execute the policy so they can't make me right. the, the ancient greeks didn't allow the council for example to declare war if there was going to be a Understood. declaration of war everyone had to vote on it that's very interesting but you know in my discussions with some of the friends and other people you know there's an argument that's um put forward and they say that running a government is is not child's play you know you need to know all these things you know you for example you mentioned finance minister he has a certain skill experience and expertise and based on that he makes a decision uh which is you know uh, supposedly the better decision as opposed to a decision that the general public would make uh, without having that skill expertise or experience um so don't you think that would hurt uh, a democracy well, or firstly, that would hurt decision making well firstly there is no um exam qualification to be an mp and there shouldn't be any uh, exam qualification for it um the the question is whether a person who claims to be expert is really expert in interpreting what's in the interests of the majority of the population because Correct. the people who claim to be expert, they're drawn from right. a narrow substratum of the population. And if you look at the British cabinet, they're all millionaires. Uh, Understood. As, as such, they, they really have very little feeling for the situation that the majority of the population are in. The majority of the population earns less than 26,000 a year. So yep. millionaires don't really, they may be expert, but their weighting of what's important is going to be different from the average person's weighting of what's important. They may yeah, now, now that's a very good point. So I, I think you really clarify that, that you know the public's interest should take precedence over uh, someone's expertise in the subject because you know I could be the best uh, you know businessman in the area but you know if I have the capitalist mindset I would always be thinking about making myself the biggest amount of profit and cutting everybody else's wages in the area even if you're not individually um, corrupt like that your upbringing and your social circle will influence what you think is important and what you right. think is important is not going to be the same as what the general electorate thinks is important. That is right. And, and that's a very interesting point because uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed reading uh, in the book Towards the New Socialism was how you uh, broke down why the past uh, experiments of socialism failed, so to speak, right? And I think there's a lot of a stigma attached these days. Whenever we talk about socialism to our friends and family, they're like, you know, look at USSR, it kind of fell down, look at Venezuela and all that. But if you really break it down, you would understand that the causes of failure were not the model of socialism itself, but because they were run by a government that was either uh, authoritarian in na nature, uh, like uh, Joseph Stalin, or it was uh, a problem of corruption, like in the time of Brezhnev. Um, so by the model that you propose, if we have a democracy where really people are involved, you know, I, I think it would solve that problem as well, because in that model, there's no authoritarianism, and there's, I don't think there's a chance of corruption because all the people are, um, they come together in a, in a council from a random 
uh, lottery, right? Which means they don't know each other. They can't really collude uh, with they each other because nobody them. knows, right? And and they also are, are not not career politicians. They're, they're just citizens who for a few months are doing this as a, a duty. Um, they're not in there like any professional politician is, which is to calculate how can I improve my career. They're, right. they're just there as, as ordinary citizens trying to say, what does it seem to me as an ordinary citizen? And by taking a, a random sample of the population, you make sure that all social groups, all sexes, both sexes, uh, all racial groups are equally represented compared to their population weight. That kind of random sampling is what any opinion pollster would use if they wanted to find out what the opinion of the population is. They take a random sample. So it's the only scientific way to do it. I understood. And, and that's very interesting. If I understand your model of democracy correctly, this takes off the burden of running a campaign from my shoulders. Because uh, being an eligible citizen, I'm already included in that uh, lottery, right? I don't really have to run a campaign. I don't have to take no. uh, days off from work. I don't have to spend money. I don't have to uh, you know, know people of influence and so on and so forth. Uh, so that is a very interesting idea. You know, there's there really no burden campaigns. on it. There still would be campaigns. There would be, I mean, you would expect environmental groups to run campaigns. You'd expect um, various local interest groups to run campaigns for their locality. So there would be campaigns, but they would be campaigns in the same way that um, a wildlife protection group at the moment campaigns to win support in the public. It wouldn't be a matter of um, political campaigning. It would be trying to Correct. influence public opinion so that the random sample was likely to pick people who had the public opinion that you'd been pressing for. Right. So, so you're yeah. saying the campaign would not be in favor or against a person, but in favor or against policies and procedures. Yes. So, yes. so that's very interesting. And then... How, how do political parties come in play? Because right now, we basically what happens is when I'm voting for my MP in the area, mainly I'm vo voting for my political party, right? Which uh, kind of aligns with my political ideology, being it uh, conservative, liberals, or uh, social democrats, so on and so forth. Um, so in your model of democracy, is there a party system? Well, I think parties would still exist. They wouldn't be bodies which try and campaign for a group of politicians. Okay. But they might exist as bodies which try to influence public opinion. All right. So that is that is very interesting and the unique to me. existing parties, Quebec Independence Party, that campaigns for right. Quebec independence, but it would do it by trying to influence public opinion rather than by trying to get politicians elected. Right. And, 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 that's, and that's very interesting and unique to me. You know, I'm almost startled thinking about that because, you know, that really um, makes a lot of things very interesting that we go from uh, favoring or going against a certain person to helping people really understand the issues to, you know, to influence people over yeah. actual issues. Now, we've had a lot of experience of that in Britain because we've had a whole series of referendums recently. And right. what, what's happened with these referendums is that you've had campaigns which don't necessarily line up with political parties. Uh, they're campaigning right. groups who campaign on it, but they're not identical to the political parties. The, the yes and no campaigns were not equivalent to the pre-existing political parties. They were All right. organized around the issue. So there's there's no political party in power, so to speak. No, it's always the public that's taking or tackling each issue separately. Uh, and I think yeah, if I'm getting you correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of the benefits of this is I do not have to compromise on any of my opinions or values. For example, I can, uh, you know. Uh, vote seventy percent of the time in favor of one thing that one political party stands for, but I do not have to compromise on the rest of the thirty percent of the issues that I do not agree 
uh, with them on, right? And and in Correct. those thirty percent of the cases, I can vote for you know would vote for something that I, I ideologically goes against that party. I mean, to take the Brexit issue, um, right. I voted to leave the European Union, even mm -hmm. though if it had been a if there was an election, as there was an election a short while later, I would vote for the, voted for the Labour Party. But the Labour Party was in favour of staying in the European Union. Uh, Correct. So people's um, policies on on a referendum don't necessarily line up with their favourite party. Awesome. Thank you very much. You know that is very interesting, and I I'm pretty sure I learned a lot uh, and. All right, so that was Mr. Paul Cockshot explaining his proposed uh, model of democracy to us. I really enjoyed the episode. I really learned a lot and I feel enlightened. I'm honored that he joined us on the show. I'm really sorry that there was uh, a lot of glitches in terms of audio and visual quality because of a bad internet connection that I'm having today. Um, so I would try to quickly summarize the points that we talked about. So first off, he introduced his um, model of democracy by saying that it's not going to be a system of MPs, but rather a system of councils uh, that are formed uh, through a lottery uh, that is drawn on the register of all eligible citizens. So that takes off the financial burden of an individual shoulders, right? If you want to run for office, you don't really now need all the money and time. The current political system uh, puts on your shoulders. All you got to do is... Um, submit your application form, show your interest, and you would be in, included in that register of people uh, that the lot would be drawn on. And once, the, and once the council is formed, people would be having referendums uh, on major issues rather than you know, giving the decision-making power to that council itself. The council would do the day-to-day -day work, and whenever there is a major decision to be made, a referendum would be held where the public would um, cast a vote. Uh, we talk about how someone needs skills, expertise, and experience in a certain area to make decisions in that area. But the idea here is that regardless of the skills, expertise, and experience, uh, if a person does not belong to a certain group or does not rep uh, represents the uh, national fabric, their decision cannot guarantee the interest of the general public. So the interest of the general public would take precedence over what someone um, believes to be the better decision based on their own experience, which is driven uh, by their economic circumstances. So that is profound. I mean, think of a place where you can run for office without spending a lot of money, without spending invest, without having to invest a lot of time, and only get to the office when you get selected in the council. The second issue that it addresses is the issue of the human bias. Now, because you're not voting for one person your bias cannot really affect the process because it's a lot. So from that lot, everybody, regardless of their faith, color, ethnic background, so on and so forth, has an equal opportunity of getting selected through that random lottery. And the most interesting thing about this model of democracy is there won't be any party in power. It's always going to be the public that's in power and it's going to be voting on issues separately as opposed to voting for a party that then makes decisions. And some of those decisions might not be the decisions that you would want to make. And currently that's a problem. You have, let's say three major parties running for elections and each of these party only align um, at a certain level with your ideology or your values. So let's say party A, party B and party C and party A only say is 30% of what you think is the right thing to do. And the 70% that they say is something that you don't agree with. And then party B is like a 50, 50. And then in case of party C, uh, your ideology aligns with them as 70%. So you end up voting for that party knowing that 30% of the things that they would do uh, are not the things that you would want, are not the things that you agree with. But in the new proposed form of democracy that Mr. Paul Cockshot was discussing, you would not be forced to vote for a party and compromise on 30% or even 10% of the issues that you stand for on a different side. Because every time you would be voting for a separate issue at a time as opposed to uh, giving charge to the party, letting them make all the decisions for you. So I really hope this was a great episode. It was a really new and fresh perspective for everybody. And I hope 
if you don't agree with anything at all, it at least starts some interesting conversations and give you something to think about. I would love to hear your thoughts about this. Uh, even if it's a disagreement, I would love to uh, listen to that. I always think that you learn a lot from people who disagree with you because they offer you a new perspective uh, and a new angle as well. Um, I just request everybody to be respectful of everybody else's views here. Thank you very much. Till next time, God bless. All the best. Thank you.